actually carried its own weight uh, totally, not in weapons, but in, in total. Um, so she could carry eight 1,000 pound bombs, uh, which was our normal operational uh, configuration. And then if we use the AS-30 air to ground missile, we take four of the bombs you've seen in the photograph there in the bomb bay and the AS-30 missiles, one on each wing, um, which was quite a potent.
This evening, we have a very special guest in our lockdown studio. In fact, he's located down in Great Brack, and uh, I'm located in the same position that I'm always at, my residence. Our guest this evening is none other than Lieutenant Colonel Dave Knussen, someone that has meant a huge amount to me in my personal life, because it is Dave Knussen that introduced me into the exciting world of aviation, and even better still, into the exciting world of working with the South African Air Force. A man that served the Air Force for over 35 years and has flown a huge variety of different aircraft. He has over seven and a half thousand flying hours, and he will now tell us about his incredible career. A man that is highly respected in South Africa and has written himself into the history books. Well, it's a hearty good evening to my special guest this evening, Dave Knussen. How are you doing, Dave? Ah, I'm well, Brian. Thanks for the invite and uh, I look forward to chatting. Well, I must say, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you've played a very big role and that is because you are the person that introduced me into the South African Air Force by appointing me as your commentator during your term at the Silver Falcons. Of course, this went yes. on and is still current. So uh, for over 30 years, you know, I've been uh, wearing the Silver Falcons jacket with pride and it's all thanks to you. But this evening, it's all about you. Coming out of a very disciplined home, both your mum and your dad were in uniform. And of course, who will ever forget the highly respected Sergeant Major Charlie Knusson? Let's pick it up there, Dave. Right, yes. Um, my dad was in the Air Force from the late 30s. And uh, he went to war, World War II. He was up in Italy um, with 12 Squadron and 31 Squadron. And during the war, he met my mom, who was uh, in the WAFs. Uh, so they uh, shacked up, got married. And then after that, my father went with two squadron to Korea, served there with them. So my Air Force foundation was, was quite strong. And as far as the flying goes, uh, my sister got her PPL at 17 in uh, 1961 and uh, at the time she was the youngest female pilot in South Africa so uh, they put her in Heisgenoot as a big article as well so my aviation uh, call it foundation is very good. Indeed I'm intrigued by the fact you know when you say that your uh, father was in two squadron the flying cheetahs that is a uh, a really sort of a, a squadron with a very rich heritage. And of course, that was an ideal seed to plant for you to just become very, very interested. You, of course, uh, joined the Air Force and uh, you went on to 42 Squadron. Yes, um, I got, uh, we, I was on Pupes course one of 67, uh, a large course, 81 of us qualified after that. Uh, then we were transferred around the country and six of us were sent after the, we got our wings. We were sent to Potch of Sturm and the squadron there at the time was 42 Army Air Reconnaissance in 1968 that was and would later in 69 become 42 Squadron. So that was my first squadron after qualifying. And uh, it was a tremendous learning curve because they taught us to be the best bush pilots you would ever find. The aircraft you were flying, very interesting because we, as uh, a much later era, got to know 42 for flying the Bosbok. And it was 11 Squadron in my day that was flying the, uh, the Cessnas later to become the light aircraft flying school. So... Uh, you were flying the little Cessna 185s and uh, you had incredible tours, not only in South Africa. Yes, um, it was basically the 1966, the bush war started kicking off 
And uh, all they had up in the bush in Southwest Africa and Angola was the LO3s and the Cessnas. So we used to deploy together with the LO3s. We were working, of course, then with the Portuguese. Uh, they were in Angola and we did many sorties and ops with the Portuguese uh, armed forces uh, in Angola, which was, of course, very exciting. And uh, moving up into Angola, it's a beautiful, vast, you can't believe how beautiful it is there. But uh, I knew Angola pretty well. I even flew all the way up to Luanda. Good heavens. And uh, the places there in your day would have been places like Sarpo Pinto, Novelish Boa, uh, Silver Porte, Musamides. Uh, yes, Sasha. and uh, the, the famous Quito Quanaval. I had many an evening there as well with, with the uh, Portuguese chaps, and uh, very nice. And then we deployed for two weeks at a time to Serpa Pinto, which is, I think, now Monongwe. Dave, and, and it was mainly flying reconnaissance, doing reconnaissance work. Um, it was actually, um, yes, reconnaissance, a lot of that. And then we had to deploy troops. For instance, we used to fly the Bushman trackers around um, to deploy them when they were on ops. And uh, we used to do supplies as well, fly supplies in and out. And the odd general that did a tour from Portugal, of course, we'd fly them around and so on. So uh, it was a very diverse type of work that we did. And the Cessna 185 is like a mini C-130. You can do anything with it and it performs. Sort of a sky jeep. Yeah, I say a land cruiser. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must smile when you see all these hundreds of people writing on the internet and joining Facebook sites. Uh, I served in Angola, I fought the war. And it all started in 1975 with Operation Savannah, where you know behind the scenes, you guys were there. You got the T-shirt, you drank the cooker beer, and uh, you came back, and all of a sudden, it all exploded. It was just an escalation, however, 75 onwards. Yes, of course, that's where that was where the whole, uh, the very serious part of the border war started, and then we got, as South Africa, we got more and more involved. And then they brought in more sophisticated aircraft until, say, late 88, when everything ended. So, Dave, from the uh, Cessnas, uh, where did you uh, move on to then? Yes, this is quite interesting. We, uh, Pete, Vivian, and I were at 42 Squadron. And while we were there, we did an Impala conversion down at Langerbahn. And then from there, we were posted to Petersburg to 85 Advanced Flying School to do a pilot attack instructor's course. Uh, it started off on vampires, and the way through the course, the vampires were withdrawn from service, and we continued the course on Impalas, and we finished the course, and then we were both resident instructors at 85 uh, well, I was there for an additional year after the course, and uh, that's where we uh, did all the pilot attack instruction. So you'd flown uh, the Vampire, which was a, a, an aircraft that was initially, I think, seconded to or used by, by one squadron. Yes, I think they had a varied career because it was now the, the very first jet that was now officially in uh, SAF service and uh, one and two squadrons and so on. They were the sort of frontline squadron. So I assume that they used them, you know, after the delivery. Very special. So you were flying Impalas. At that stage, the Impala must have been brand spanking new. Yes, um, we got the Impalas and uh, some of the squadrons, of course, were still waiting. For instance, after Petersburg, I was transferred to 8th Squadron, who had just received the Impalas. Harvards were gone. And then as a PAI at 8th Squadron, I was uh, to get all the guys up to speed with weapons, conversions, etc., etc., at 8th Squadron. 
So that was in uh, 1973 uh, that they got the Impalas. Those were the Mark 1s. Later, we got Mark 2s as well. Eight Squadron just down the road from me because uh, they're based in Bloemfontein. And in my chat with Chris Pretorius, we were actually talking a lot about Eight Squadron because I had the honor of uh, working very closely with air pilots. Little did I know, but I was still at school at the time. And uh, you were just down the road. From the Impala, where did you move on to then? Well, from 8 Squadron, I stayed in Impala, then I was transferred to uh, Langebaan Vaf, my first tour, 76, and there I did the, I was a flight commander of the uh, pupil pilots uh, section, and then they decided that the pupil pilots would all do a weapons course before it was decided where they would be put after they qualified. So I then ran the, the weapons flight, to get all the students and assess them and see where they would be transferred to after their, um, their weapons course and their future career. Was that then still the flying training school, FDS Langebaan, was that 83 jet flying? No, that was flying training school Langebaan Weg. Yes, 76 to 79 that I was there. And from there, you then moved on to the big guys. Yes, yeah, the fast one. Yeah, it was interesting. I was down at the flight line signing books to, to uh, go out to fly, and I got a phone call from Al Gerbs Gerber. All the guys will remember him. And he said to me, Dave, where do you want to go when you're finished? Yeah. So immediately I said, oh, I'd like to go and do the Mirage course. And uh, next thing, the posting came out and I was transferred back to Petersburg, and uh, then we commenced the Mirage OCC. So you were on the Mirage 3EZ, the trainer aircraft? Correct, yes, and the DZ as well for the training, but on yeah. the EZ, yes. And that, and that time would have had Graham Rochard and uh, the guys there? No, uh, strangely enough, uh, Jan Rankin was there again, and the OC was Chris Lombard, and uh, Paddy Carolyn was there. So it was that sort of group of guys. And uh, Harvey Winterbach as well. And I can't think of the others. So you were now on the Mirage, and you were really enjoying it because it's fast, it's furious, and you saw visions of Tom Cruise and Top Gun. Yeah, I think, I think all the guys do, eh? I mean, it's the ultimate flying. I think everybody uh, desires to be in a fast jet. Yeah. What happened after that, uh, Dave? Then I was transferred to 24 Squadron. The policy at the time, uh, after all the accidents on the Bucks, they changed the policy and said to get to the Buccaneers, you had to go through the Mirage course so, uh, so that you get more experience on fast jets. And so after the course, we were transferred out. The other guys went to uh, one and two squadron. And luckily for me, I was transferred to 24 squadron, to Buccaneers. And you became a pirate. Yes, <laughs> all the way, all the way. I, I remember going on a visit to 24 with you and I saw, I think it was a banner or something, hit the floor, it's 24. Now the, yeah, Buccaneers, yeah. the Buccaneers had a, an interesting history. Uh, they were somewhat plagued with, with um, problems. Not, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, just the sophistication, you would know you were there, but uh, we did lose a, a couple of, of Buccaneers. Yes, we did. Um, we had quite a few accidents. And when I arrived at the squadron, we only had six Buccaneers left of the total of 16, which we purchased, of course, earlier. And uh, so it was critical in handling at some stages. It was beautiful to fly. It was a pilot's aircraft through and through. And uh, But some of the accidents related to the aerodynamics and the flying of the aircraft. So the decision 
to route the guys through uh, the Mirage course would give them a little more um, uh, experience in, in flying the fast jets. Although the Buccaneer, of course, wasn't supersonic, but it, it was a mean machine, for sure. The Buccaneers uh, that we had in South Africa in the Air Force fulfilled an incredible role because you guys were trained to deliver fuel as, as a, 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 an airborne uh, refueler and your weapon load and the, the missiles and the bombs that you could carry, as we saw in the photograph with the, at air shows, we had the bombs painted so we could show yeah. the, uh, the, bomb, the bombs in the bay. Uh, she carried, yes. I think that famous, was it AS-40? Uh, it carried uh, some serious uh, munitions. Yes, that's, uh, it was a magnificent aircraft. It actually carried its own weight. Uh, totally, not in weapons, but in, in total. Um, so she could carry eight 1,000-pound bombs, uh, which was our normal operational uh, configuration. And then if we use the AS-30 air-to-ground missile, we take four of the bombs you've seen in the photograph there in the bomb bay, and the AS-30 missiles, one on each wing. Um, which was quite a potent combination because when we opened Ops Protea, we had to take out the radar stations with the AS-30 missiles and then do a secondary attack with the bombs on another target, uh, which proves the flexibility of the, of the Buccaneer. And, uh, of course, we could do all that with plenty of fuel, uh, internal fuel, uh, was around 15,000 pounds of fuel. Um, so we didn't have any problems with that. You could, apart from the buddy packs that you could do off the bucks, you could also go to Eagle, the, the Boeing, and, and get fuel from the Boeing. Um, in my time, we didn't have the Boeing, but we could do buddy tanking if a buccaneer to buccaneer um, if we required it. But the, the range was so good. Uh, for our normal operations, uh, we did one operation from Waterkloof, went far beyond the borders, returned again, um, it was far, 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 and uh, we were airborne for three hours, 15 minutes. Dave, you and Charlie Roth, it was, uh, it was something, you know, in the squadron, the, the, the trust and the camaraderie, the esprit de corps amongst the navigators became legend. I mean, you, you had guys like Sandy Roy. Uh, I'm sure Rimmaton was in the squadron at, at a time. You had all these legendary guys, but you and Charlie Roth, uh, he calls himself Backstreet Roth. I've been in the back of a buck, so I know why he calls it Backstreet. But you guys became a formidable team, a, an absolute uh, a gem of a, of a team. Yes, quite right, but uh, Brian is back seat, Roth, not back street. <laughs> uh, hence, him sitting in the back seat of the buck. And uh, we started our course together, and uh, we just got on extremely well together. So we stayed as a team. Uh, we did plenty of operations together, and we just enjoyed flying. Together we won uh, the weapons trophy at 24 Squadron, uh, which they had annually. So we won that trophy. And then it was just one of those associations with your crew member that was, I would say, perfect. You know, because you has, there has to be a lot of trust between the two. I found that I decided before uh, I was there that I would never question the navigator. I would respect his professionalism. And I think that added to our camaraderie and our uh, uh, working together so that he could do his job and I could just do the job in the front cockpit and rely totally on him. A man that could think fast, still can back seat, sorry, Charlie, <laughs> and uh, also brilliant mathematician because he had to be hot on the maths. 
But when you come about the trust and the camaraderie, you guys were chosen for an incredible sortie. And I'm now referring to chasing down a missile being fired from a strike craft. Now, they had the Scarpion missiles, and you and Charlie and your beloved buccaneer were chosen to chase down and actually fly in formation with a missile. Uh, there are a lot of people that would probably just shake their head, but tell us about that. Yeah, we, we also, we were tossed, and when we were tossed, we also thought, oh, this, this sounds a little bit far-fetched, and uh, we ferried down to Cape Town. We went to the Navy uh, for the briefing, and yeah, you think missile, this thing is going to motor. So we said to them, listen, we this is our, our maximum speed is 580 knots at sea level. What does the missile do? Because we all expect it to go very far. So the guy said, no, it only cruises at 420 knots. But you thought, wow, that's a relief because the Buccaneer cruises normally at 480 knots low level. So that was fine. So what happened was very far south of Cape Point, uh, the ships were deployed. There were two strike craft and, and various others. The target was placed 20 kilometers from the strike craft, and it was the old frigate SAS Jan van Riebeck, which was now being taken out of service. So we took off, went down out to sea, met the, uh, the Navy down there, and we had to fly a uh, holding pattern around this strike craft, the race course pattern. And we had to then time exactly at the moment that the missile was fired, we had to be right above the strike craft and then turn onto the direction of fire and then descend and formate on the missile. So, we went into the holding pattern a couple of times, and then the countdown started. And of course, you're very tense because it's if you're out a second or two, you've got a bit of a problem. So Charlie did all the calculations perfectly. And as they hit the button, the missile left the strike craft. It climbs up to about 100, 150 feet. Then it descends down to about 50 or 60 feet in the cruising configuration. And as it descended down to, let's call it 60 feet, we slotted in next to it and we maintained our position. The purpose was, they, it was the first missile they were firing, so it was an experimental one, and we had to photograph it. They were scared something would go wrong, so we, had a massive camera in the back cockpit that just fitted in, and this thing apparently ran at 500 frames per second because they needed a high-speed camera in case the missile came, came apart. So we chased the missile with Charlie photographing it, and at 15 kilometers, the missile then descends to about 12 feet. But from that point, we had to pull up so that we weren't at the point of impact when it struck the ship. So as it descended, when it picks up the uh, target with its own radar, it descends to that height because it needs to strike just above the waterline of the target. So we pulled up, did a wing over, and we watched the missile impact, and it was a perfect shot. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Hit the boat, of course, the Navy guys went crazy because it was successful and they were now seriously operational. And uh, then we did a few fly pasts, the other boats gave them some shoot ups and returned to Cape Town. And there's nothing like a buccaneer shoot up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're quite right, yes, quite right. The, the fear must have also played a part. You know, you flying there and you know that. This is a, a prototype missile, you know, was there no fear that this missile could turn around and bite you at some stage? 
No, not at all. No, it, um, we didn't even think of that. So uh, we couldn't be scared of something we didn't know. Um, but um, you know that the Scarpion was a development of, a, of another missile. So that had been tested previously overseas. Not many pilots that can actually say that they have flown in formation with a missile that's fired off a, off a warship. I think I, it's probably the only time it's been done. I know it was planned later on again, but the flight was cancelled. So um, we think we're about the only guys in South Africa that have have achieved that. Pro probably of the very few in the world. I, I know uh, you were at the show when uh, General Des Barker fired a missile, uh, a, you know, at an at an air show, a live missile at the air show, and that was the first time in the world, you know, that a missile was fired at an air show where there were yes. spectators, and we actually watched it hit the target, you know, at the air show. So South Africa leads when it comes to some pretty exciting achievements. For sure, yes, I was at that air show as well. Uh, very exciting to see it. Um, Dave, so from the Buccaneers, you then had the opportunity to move on to Queen of the Skies. Yes, yes, uh, the Queen of the Skies, the Canberra. Now, interestingly enough, the Canberra was the first British jet bomber developed and put into service with the RAF. And the Buccaneer was the last all-British bomber made. All those subsequent to that were combined with uh, the European company. So I had the, the honor of flying the first British jet bomber and the last all British jet bomber. The Queen of the Skies, it was quite a strange posting because I was posted in at, um, as the officer commanding. So I was the senior officer in the squadron, but I was the junior pilot because I hadn't flown the aircraft yet. So, um, very different from the Buccaneer. Of course, it was first generation um, jet bomber where the Buccaneer was much more advanced. Uh, but you soon get to love the aircraft and uh, I really enjoyed flying it. We did a lot of operations up north, um, Southwest Africa and Angola in the bombing role and the photo recce role. The photo recce role was very important. Um, during the border war. And here you did not have Charlie Roth with you. Uh, you had a new navigator, uh, Divi De Villiers. Yes, Divi was an excellent, excellent chap. We also had a, a good relationship um, in the canny, but uh, so different because the canny had the bomb aimer lying in the nose, a la Second World War type of bombing. So he was a little removed from you, down the bottom in the aircraft, lying down and uh, aiming through, through the bomb site as such. It must have been quite a challenge for that, uh, you know, for, for the, the uh, bomber, the navigator lying on his, flat on his stomach and, you know, and of course the hair raising with the takeoff because uh, she's a big aircraft and of course hurtling down the runway and he's, He's virtually right in the front. He's got his nose up against the uh, the glass. Yeah, I think I think it was more exciting for them to be there and uh, you know get airborne, and then we continued. And of course, he had a little, we'll call it a cabin there, and he had a little chair with a, a navigation table to do plotting as well. And uh, then further back in the in the cockpit, he had a and another individual seat which you could sit on on the long trips. And the interesting thing is because he was down below and we did long transit flights, he used to get very cold down there because the pilot was up in the sun in the cockpit and uh, we sometimes had icicles down in the bottom in the navigation compartment. And uh, yeah, very few people realize you know, of those incredible sorties. I mean, there's not much written about uh, the uh, bombing runs of, of 12. A lot of people are aware of what 12 Squadron was doing, but, you know, there wasn't really a big hoo-ha made of those night missions, 
uh, you know, making use of marker beacons to go out and, uh, you know, take out those various targets. And you played a, a squadron and the aircraft played a, a huge role. I know towards uh, the latter part of Operation Savannah and then, of course, right into most of the external operations. Yes, the Kenny, I think, was, has been underrated um, in the Bush War. Um, as you say, it wasn't sort of popularized as such, but the work that the Kennys did was incredibly important, especially in the early days when uh, they created, they took the photography for all the, the maps that we used during the Bush War, the photo maps, and that was all thanks to, to the early days with the Cairns when they mapped most of southern Angola, uh, which of course helped during the later stages. But the, um, the candy was underrated. We did night bombing, we did day bombing, we did high level bombing, we did low level bombing as well from uh, about 300 feet with the alpha bombs. And then the recce we did from various altitudes depending on the threat. And uh, a lot of the um, photo recce sorties, we had to go out with the um, Mirage F1 escorts because the canny, because it was an early uh, bomber, it, it wasn't very fast. So we needed uh, escorts normally from three squadron. Uh, they'd send two guys to look after us. And uh, so we always had buddies with us when we did a long shot uh, up north. The, the uh, Mirages, when they were working down in Langebur, uh, Langebur, Langebarn, would often uh, laugh at the Oryx guys and call them babysitters because they'd be there that if there was a bailout, they'd go to, uh, to help the guys. So uh, to technically, those mirages were your babysitters. They were there looking after you. And uh, it's probably something you really would need because you're a big bird, unarmed, just carrying lots and lots of bombs. Yes, and, uh, and uh, of course, the performance of the canny, um, any fighter could outturn it. The turning performance wasn't all that hot. At high, high altitude, it was good. Then we could outperform the guys in a turn, um, but that was the only advantage that it had because it was an early generation aircraft. But the coordination when we were there with the helicopters, the Telstars in the, in the uh, Bosbocker and so on, it was a complete system um, that was looking after you. A very well-oiled system and uh... Yeah, the pride of the nation. Let's move on now from the uh, Canberra. What was your next posting? Okay, then I was fortunate enough to go back to Longabon, my second tour, and uh, I took over as officer commanding of 83 Jet Flying School from Johan Rankin, who preceded me as OC. And uh, there we trained the, the jet pilots for the Air Force and thrown into your duties was the Silver Falcons. So you took over. It became, I think, Team 31 from Johan Rankin as the new leader of the Silver Falcons. And that yes. is where you started to, because now you became a very big public figure. Uh, yes. You introduced, you made so many changes, all for the good. Uh, you know, the, the uniforms, the flying overalls, there was a change. You had those scarves. The aircraft uh, were yeah. being painted up. And, of course, with your lovely wife, Bev, it really, really sort of saw the Silver Falcons becoming the cockpit ambassadors for the South African Air Force. Yes, quite right. When I got there, I realized that the Air Force had an asset which they were underplaying. In the first 14 years of the team's existence, they only flew 47 shows. And in the four years I was there, we did 68 shows. So we really sort of upped the ante. As you say, we made posters, we made pamphlets, we made bumper stickers. We improved. If you look in that picture there, when I got there, the Colors were not on the bottom of the aircraft. Uh, Ollie Holmes was responsible for the side and the nose and the tail. And we decided that we need 
to have more impact. We painted the bottom of the aircraft with the colors as well. And then we looked around and we saw what the overseas teams were doing. And they had an announcer and they had music. Uh, and they made quite a dramatic thing of the air shows. So we were in for an announcer and in for music. And uh, then I came upon you at Tempe one day, I think it was, what, 1987? And uh, then we started getting things going. And then the demand went up. The people started asking for air shows, air shows, air shows. And uh, we started telling headquarters, well, we need to, to advertise um, this um, aspect of the Air Force. So we pushed it up and then we started doing plenty of shows. It was actually quite interesting because you and I were standing in a queue at the Tempe Air Show. It was the evening and we were queuing for supper and you were standing behind me. And of course, I suddenly realized that standing behind me was the leader of the Silver Falcons. And of course, we got chatting. I was there yes. with Capital Radio 604, the Transky based radio station. We struck up an incredible rapport. Uh, you know, and you said, listen, come along. You can be our commentator. And I still wondered how that was going to work. Well, you made it work. I mean, I didn't only do every major show that the Silver Falcons did at air shows. But um, yeah. the, the, the Dakota of 25 Squadron, the Cape-based Dakota, used to pass the city I live in. So, of course, I'd hop, a, hop on, fly with the crew, with the, the ground crew. And yes. uh, I ended up doing all. And it was incredible. As I said in the opening, you changed my life for me because uh, suddenly I got to do the very big shows of the Air Force because the Air Force said, well, look, if you've got this radio guy that's doing the Silver Falcons and he's playing music and doing, you know, commentary with radio links, yes. let's utilize him. So uh, it was incredible. And uh, I'm indebted to you. Let's move on to those changes because you brought in, in this is now, and I say our, because I was now an integral part. I had a number. You, uh, you uh, gave me Falcon 6 because you brought yes. in Quibus Crystal as the yes. very first Falcon 5. Yes, we, we also noticed with the, some of the other teams that with the turnarounds, there was a bit of a lull in the, in the show. So we needed a, a, somebody to fill in the lull. And we decided then to bring in the fifth man. We had an aerobatic competition at the unit and the winner would be automatically be the number five in the team so we introduced number five and of course that enhanced the show tremendously made it more exciting um, people were entertained throughout the 10 or 12 minutes that we gave the show and then with your commentary you would allow the people to look in the correct place look to your right look to your left look to your front and you would see what was happening so it enhanced the whole show with a commentary so the people could enjoy it more. We also uh, had, you know, a, a very strong rapport with the public. That was was that when the team, you know, had landed, there was posing for photographs, and there was the strong inspiration to recruit youngsters to become pilots, to become. And we know people like Colin Coombs, who was inspired yes. by what he saw. And he went yes. on to join the Air Force to become a, a fighter pilot. Yeah, and he's done very well uh, recently. He's flying all over the world by the look of things. But the primary objective was recruiting. Um, we needed the pilots. And then secondary, of course, it displayed the skill of the pilots that were serving and, of course, the skill of the ground crew as well who maintained the aircraft. I'd just like to say it to all the ground crew guys that I ever worked with, a hell of a lot of thanks because I flew for 35 years and never had one technical problem, which I think is a record. So thanks to all the ground crew guys out there. Yeah, and I must say thank you to you because I flew with you and flew the whole air show sequence, which was incredible because that gave me the opportunity 
to know exactly as the commentator being able to tell the people what the G-suit's doing, how close the aircraft are. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you can only do that when you've experienced it. Dave, if we move on, we had uh, some phenomenal reunions. The first one was, of course, 21. You flew all the guests down on Castile, the only Viscount. Yes, yes. And yes. I would remember and the excitement on the Viscount, all these ex-Silver Falcons. For me, it was the first reunion. I was going to be the commentator at the reunion. And when we looked out the windows, there you guys were. You intercepted us and yes. escorted us to the reunion. Yes, wonderful. Those were the good days, of course, when we had the Castile, the Viscount, and uh, we welcomed you all at the, at the um, control tower, and then we commenced the show. And of course, now you're giving a show for all the ex-Silver Falcons, and that probably makes you more nervous than anything else because they will be more critical. Um, but it went off very well. We had a lovely reunion. It was lovely seeing all the guys. Chris Prince, the founder of the Silver Falcons, was there, and uh, he complimented us, and we were very happy with that. And those reunions became very, it became an integral part because I remember the reunion with uh, uh, Pierre Duplessis where he intercepted with his team and they uh, intercepted the Boeing 707, which was flown by two former Falcons, Mitz Moritz and uh, Roly Jones. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's brilliant. Eh? So it was of what, a five aircraft formation with Silver Falcon? Indeed it was. And of course, on board, you know, were all the Falcons. Bobby Crinnell was on board there. Uh, Charles yes. Kutsia. We had everybody. Uh, Martin Lowe. We just had a huge... I was, as I say, I was in the back, so I was taking photos, having an absolute blast. If we move on uh, now from Falcons to the next phase of your career. Right. Um, after that, I was transferred to training command, was there for three years as staff officer flying training to look after the flying schools as such. And while I was there, I put in a request for a transfer to the museum. A lot of guys thought I was crazy, but um, anyway, they uh, authorized the transfer after my tour at training command and uh, landed up at the museum, which of course uh, was also a very big boost for my flying career. You, you, uh, you always have been passionate. We just saw a photo come up there of you flying the Spitfire, uh, the spirit of Roytech. Uh, you yes. did a lot of changes, all for the good at the museum. Uh, you know, the museum was flourishing. I re recall when the I think the crankshaft broke and we wow. needed money to get your yes. aeroplane flying. And I put out an appeal and raised 48,000 bucks. We still put it in a dustbin and it was done in yes. like a half an hour. And it was just yes. unbelievable. There was this huge outpouring of love and kindness from the South African aviation uh, community. Fantastic. Yes, I, of course, remember that day very well. But the, you're quite correct. The museum was another, it was actually the Vierskant of the Air Force when I got there. Um, and uh, I started up by just cleaning up the, the place at SWAT Corps, getting things going and motivating the guys. Then we started with our regular air shows, former air shows, air displays, and the people started taking more interest. Uh, in the museum, and so we built it up quite quite a lot to have regular air shows and so on. And at one stage, we had 22 flyable aircraft at the museum, which was more than one or two of the squadrons. And uh, <laughs> so while I was there, we got the Spitfire flying, we got the Mustang flying, and shortly after I left, uh, the Sabre got airborne as well. So I was instrumental in getting those things going nicely. And uh, in the end, the Air Force started using the museum for all their parades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because it was the 
ideal spot for all that type of thing. Yeah, nothing like having a Spitfire flying over Bays Hill. Now, a photograph that just appeared there, and we'll come back, where we see you flying the Spitfire and Rick Culpin flying the uh, Cheetah. Yes. Um, and I was formatting on a Harvard. And the photographer was Dion Rolls. So we weren't going very fast. We were in a very slight descent. So the Harvard was going as fast as it could in call it a slight dive. And we'd arranged to meet near Cullinan. And that was the special cheetah with a, a, a newly developed wing or something like that. I'm not quite sure what it was, but it enabled Rick to formate on us and uh, take that amazing photograph. We have a few more. And just of interest, Rick Culpin was the pilot that did the test flying on the Spitfire. And he handed over to me after the test flying. I was the first museum pilot to fly it. And in that photograph, the only two Spitfire pilots in South Africa were flying the early model and the most advanced model in South Africa. Awesome. You went on this, uh, another photograph of you flying in formation with the Mirage F1As from uh, yes. One Squadron. So you really yes. did have an interesting time of flying there. From yeah, the that was, museum? That, that sort of was interesting because they had the annual memorial service at Bays Hill and uh, we on the Sunday and we had to do the fly past. The Spitfire was in One Squadron colors so um, they flew in from Hoodsprate. They met me south of Swatkop, and I led a box formation, me in the lead, uh, with the four F1s on the wing as such, and we did the fly past. And after the fly past, we also were set sail for Cullinan, and we met Hermann Portgieter there, and he was in a twin, uh, light twin aircraft, and we'd arranged that sortie undercover. Nobody knew about that sortie. So me with the Mirages on their way, we intercepted Hermon hanging out the door of this Beechcraft or whatever it was. And we did one fly past and we, I went back to uh, the museum. The Mirages went back to Hootsprite. And that was one of two photographs that Hermon got in a flash and tells you how good he was and how good uh, his photographs and the were. pilot the pilot there was chris breers and ah. uh, they were flying flying in a chieftain and ah, a chieftain. Uh, that's that's what they had there if we move on now to the sort of last part of your career in the air force right after uh, after the museum i was there and I just want to say, and I also thank uh, Rodney King at the museum was my second in command. And he was a star through and through. Uh, we worked very well together. And uh, also just as a quick reminder, we uh, won the state president's trophy air race in Kwasi while we were at the museum. The first and only time Harvard has ever won the race. And uh, that was through excellent navigation by both of us there you can see us with a trophy returning after the uh, after the race and mm -hmm. man we were extremely extremely happy about that but after that after the museum i went back to Langebaan, and at that time the astras had been brought into service and uh, i went there as uh, Chief Instructor at the at CFS, which was now at Langebaan, on Astras. And they said, now I must restart the team on Astras. So um, there we were. And I had to restart the team on Astras. It was, it was great fun because I'd done it all before in Impalas. And uh, I had uh, three excellent pilots that had done a lot of formation before. We got the team on the go, and in November of 99, at the Aesterplatte Air Show, 
General Hechter gave us the thumbs up and said, Latvai, go for it. And so the team was, call it reborn on Astros. And from there, we go on to what it is today, which is uh, brilliant. Um, just a point there in the days when I was there, we couldn't get uh, sponsorship. But these days with the sponsorship, I think it's, it's going tremendously well. Dave, you became the one and only, the first person to ever have been the leader of the JET team and the first person to become the leader of the Astros or the Pilatus PC7 Mark IIs. So that well and truly saw your name go down in the, in the annals of history in the Air Force. For sure, and uh, it can't happen again because all the, all the old buggers are still too old now, and that was just the opportunity uh, for me to get in there. And just of interest, when I took over the uh, Astra team, I was um, 50 years old. So uh, the other Falcons wouldn't have a chance to get back in, the ones that were <laughs> on uh, Impalas to get back to Astras. So that's it's a one-off been, first in life. It's been interesting to see the huge respect you know, I, I know so many of the past leaders, Vanna for Mark, Bo Skada, Roy Sproul, uh, and of course, a lot of the youngsters, Buti Tsebe, because now we were seeing a whole new generation and each and every one just treats you with the highest of respect. You know, for them, you are an icon. And it's interesting because you had the huge respect of the guys from 83 Jet Flying and again, the huge respect of uh, the youngsters, because that's, that's who they are. And uh, they just have taken the Silver Falcons, continue to strive, good sponsorship from NAC, uh, yes. you know, and just making sure that the Falcons stay. The, uh, the new leader that has just come in, sadly, because we're all in lockdown, he's also in lockdown, so he's not getting much flying. Uh, Sivu Tangana, who is the new uh -huh. leader and doing uh -huh. just as well, same pride and passion. Ah, oh, lovely. Yes, it is a passion, definitely is, but it's so satisfying, uh, you can't believe it. So Dave, you then at Overberg, we saw you fly your last show, your lovely wife arranged a farewell function, which was emotional, it was special. Uh, that was it. You'd now hung up your your helmet for the last time in the uh, in this in the South African Air Force. Yes, and I must actually thank you there because if you remember, we had a fairly low cloud base through the day, so we gave out two bad weather shows, and then suddenly when the show was over, the weather cleared, and. Uh, you said, well, give it a go. You can't give your last show as a bad weather show. Uh, let's see if we can slot in. The show had already closed. And we said, right, let's go. And uh, the show organizer said, yes. So my last show, thanks to you, was the full show. And uh, we closed down, or I closed down then uh, with the Silver Falcons. And uh, the party, of course, was most enjoyable. Yeah. Big time. And of course, Beverly, yeah. there's hardly a, a, a pilot in the Air Force, a family in the Air Force that don't know the much loved bubbly Beverly. We've, uh, you know, our family and your family, we've been to Farnborough together. We've just had incredible times. And I must pay tribute to Beverly. And of course, your son, who uh, joined, the, was in the South African Air Force, uh, did very well. I remember him. Uh, flying in parlors called San Forest, and he went on to Australia, did very, yes. very well. He was telling me that he was on uh, PC uh, nines, he's just missed the PC 21s, and then yes. uh, your daughter. So, you know, a, a really a, a family to be very proud of. Oh, definitely, definitely. And uh, as you say, Beverly stood by me through my whole career, she was my number one fan and uh, gave me all the support that I needed. And we had a lot of fun together and uh, as a family as well, because we were an Air Force family, transferred every three or four years, moved around the country. 
um, but we took it in our stride and uh, we enjoyed every minute of it. Well, as we get ready to wrap, there's one last story that I must tell because I think it's very amusing. You flew for 35 years. You flew, as we've just seen and heard, a huge amount of different aircraft. I was involved with a civilian company that needed an airborne safety officer. And I couldn't think of anybody better. I convinced you to join my team, which you did. And you were given a boss book to use as your aerial kudu. reconnaissance. I'm oh, sorry, a kudu, a kudu to yes. use as an aerial reconnaissance aircraft. And you ended up where? In the sea, upside down. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, and at the rescue, you said to me, you know, Brian, I have flown Buccaneers, Canberras, Mirages, and I have never, ever had an incident. I join your team and I end up upside down in the ocean in a kudu. But <laughs> yes, but fortunately, there were no injuries. The kudu, I don't think that kudu ever survived that one. No, I doubt it. Yeah, and that, that was after I'd retired that uh, we did that job together. And uh, on that same trip, I actually had three incidents. The one on takeoff where the door opened on the, uh, on the little twin. And then, of course, we lost an engine while we were doing the aerial coordination as well. And had to land on the road just, what's it, outside, uh, was it Hermanus? Yeah. Somewhere, yeah, in a in a light twin. So uh, I stopped you, doing anything like that after yeah, that. Yeah, you came to me. Uh, you said, you know, um, I've done these dangerous night missions into Angola, and now I come and I fly around uh, the Western Cape, and I end up landing. And you weren't even flying; you had to yeah. rely on other guys to lose engines and uh, and land on the roads. It was a Beechcraft Baron. And yes. uh, I remember having to go and do some nice talking there to get you guys out of jail. But anyway, uh, <laughs> fortunately, you were all okay. Nobody, uh, there were no incidents and it was all good. Dave, I must say yes. a very big thank you to you. You've uh, been an absolute pleasure to speak to. You've got a huge following. Guys have contacted me from Abu Dhabi, Vernon Weiss. Uh, I know yes. Pierre Dupas watching. He's in, in Australia. We've got guys yeah. all over. You've got a lot of friends. And uh, once again, thank you. I wish you and Beverly, Morgan and Jacqueline and, and her family well. And uh, not too long now, and I'm sure we'll all be out of lockdown and we'll be able to get together. Oh, well, Brian, thanks a lot. Also, thanks to all my buddies in the Air Force that I worked with. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed every minute of my career. And uh, thanks for having me on the show. Well, there you are. That is my special guest uh, for this evening. None other than the very popular, much loved Lieutenant Colonel or Commandant, whichever way you want it, David Knussen. Cheers. From me, Brian Evanus, with a very big thank you to Chris Rothman, who's the director of this production, and also the uh, engineering team from Inconet, Vanna, and Simon. We wish you well. We all remain in lockdown and we'll see you on Friday night for our next edition of Let's Get Airborne and enjoy yourself. Take care. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.